Stanton Williams, founder of Sierra Online, known to be all business, but today we're going to show you a side of him that I doubt that you've ever seen. Today we're getting weird on Weird Gaming Adventure. Welcome back or welcome front if it's the first time joining. I'm Joshua with Weird Gaming and Venture, and we have Ken Williams, co-founder of Sierra Online, creator of TalkSpot, author of several well-received boating books, blog that's smartly titled Ken Blog, author of the book Not All Fairy Tales Have Happy Endings, and is known to share meals with Bill Gates. It's quite a resume. <laughs> Ken, how the heck are you? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you today? I am wonderful. A little cold here in Missouri, but uh, it's good nonetheless. Well, good. Well, what can I tell you today? Well, so glad to have you on the show. We are truly, truly appreciative to have a titan of industry. Truly a titan of, of industry. And we thank you so much for that. So did you catch the intro where I said known to share meals with Bill Gates? Do you know what that reference was? Um, well, in my book, there's a reference to Bill Gates. And, mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know. We kind of started our companies about the same time, although mm -hmm. he did well and I, I did less well, but uh, not complaining. How humble. Yeah. And in Leisure Suit Larry, you are actually sharing a meal with, with Bill Gates in a restaurant. And so, oh, yeah? yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. By the way, oh, I didn't probably do it at the time. I haven't looked at that game in a very long time. It's uh, been it's been a little bit. So I'm sure you've been asked all of these questions a million times. So I'm going to do the best I can to ask them in different ways. And we're going to try to to really hone in on the book. And since the book is essentially a business book with a caveat of Sierra business. I'm going to go ahead and use that vein and ask you to give us a, a marketing pitch as to what to expect in the book. Well, I, you know, I, well, huh, what do I expect from the book? I, you know, I wrote the book originally thinking of it as a business book. And um, then I realized nobody would want to read a business book that it would be boring other than, uh, you know, some MBA types or something. And, and in fact, to go way back, when I started writing, I was um, originally going to write another boating book because, you know, I, mentally, I think of it as I learned more about how to run a company running a boat than I ever did running a company. Because, um, you know, I was running Sierra. If I made a mistake, I could screw up people's lives. But running a boat, if I made a mistake, then I really would kill people. Or Roberta and I would be left floating alone in the middle of the Atlantic with no place to go. So. The um, techniques that I use to kind of pull everything together and run the boat and uh, keep us alive as we, um, I mean, we crossed the Bering Sea in a 60-foot boat, or actually 68-foot. And, um, you know, we've, we've done some crazy adventures and we've, um, you know, gone through 27 countries, uh, you know, with our boat. So I started writing about that and then I kind of quickly decided that would be boring for people. And... Um, Instead, uh, somehow Sierra kept creeping in, creeping in, and before I knew it, it was suddenly a book about Sierra, and um, and you know, and Sierra was an interesting story. I mean, we went from nowhere to people still remembering us 25 years later, and then the whole thing crashed and burned. And uh, I hadn't even thought about Sierra for a long time, so it was uh, yeah. Suddenly, what started as one book became a completely different book, and there it is. So. That's incredible. And you mentioned the whole thing crashed and burned. I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm I definitely want to touch bases, touch bases on that. And it is very interesting, the book, how you converted the business aspects, but you truly told stories of, of what was going on uh, behind the scenes at Sierra. So you made it to where we were all interested and questions were answered that we didn't really have access to ask you or so. All we could hear is hearsay. Now we have, you don't even have to answer it anymore. You could just say, go read the book. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It, um, you know, questions were answered for me too. I, um, when we sold the company, I pretty much, I think deliberately wanted to think about other things. So for, um, 
Yeah, for decades, I just really didn't even think about Sierra and uh, focused instead on uh, boating and kind of living our lives. And mm -hmm. it, um, yeah, when suddenly, and part of it, you know, it, it was just a painful memory. Sierra did not end in a uh, pleasant manner. And, you know, it's a painful memories. So I never followed up to see what happened. And suddenly when it came time to write the book, I had to do research. And so I called mm -hmm. people and said, what happened? And so in a way, you know, the story that's written is what I learned from others when I called and said, what happened after I left? And um, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting story. Even I learned a lot. So, so let's, let's just go ahead and touch bases with that right there. So we know there was quite a bit that happened as you left. Uh, you sold the sold company in 1996, stayed on. Like anytime you sell a company, you have to be a, a bit of a figurehead, I suppose perhaps a little bit of conflict between uh, figureheads, if you will. Then you were gone. And then, frankly, real stuff happened. Can you give us a brief, uh, a brief rundown as to what, all of that? Yeah. It, um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I describe it as like hee-haw time or something. After um, decades of me being a, a pretty um, intense guy to work for, and really, a lot of my business, you know, I, I mentioned in the book that my job was really to say no. You know, everybody who's a game developer kind of has a, uh, you know, from an engineer to an artist to whoever, they have um, a game in mind they'd like to build. And especially the creative people are all perfectionists. And they would um, agonize over one piece of animation for the next two years if given their um, brothers. And... Uh, trying to rein those people in and get them to actually think of it as a business and ship a product when it's supposed to be delivered is tough. Um, or shutting down bad ideas for games or shutting down creeping um, features being added to a game or, you know, all kinds of things. Getting, um, you know, starting a game and saying, we're going to ship it next Christmas is not that easy. And when suddenly I wasn't around and nobody was watching the company, things kind of skidded sideways really quickly. You know, within probably six months of me leaving the company, we'd kind of transitioned from making money and shipping product to um, uh, just kind of working along, not sure what the goal was or who they worked for. <clears throat> and so it was kind of messy. And when I talked to um, people like Grinowetsky who came in, uh, there was a guy named Dave Grinowetsky that came in about a year or two years after me to run the company and the mess he saw and the amount of money it was losing um, were shocking. He was telling me how much money the company was losing. And, um, and I, I, I shouldn't say or can't say because sure. I don't know what's public, but, mm -hmm. uh, but he came into a real mess and uh, with marching orders to quickly turn it around. And uh, yeah. And then, so he had to lay people off. I mean, if, and and it's not their fault. I mean, the problem is, um, you know, kind of a lack of adult leadership or anybody in management controlling the company and everybody kind of did what they want while waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And the company skidded sideways and down it came. And, it, and it's unfortunate because the people paid the price for bad leadership. So. Ken, it's okay to say it's their fault because bad leadership the captain, let's use the ship analogy. The captain has to direct the crew. It's all right. This isn't the view. Uh, it's okay. Bad leadership. You have to have somebody who's going to massage the shoulders and then crack some necks a little bit. And sounds like that's, that's what you were. You were the no guy. And yeah. un until proven, yes. And that's one thing I, I, I got the sense when, when reading the book that I really respected uh, your, you were hard lined, but moderately flexible if if proven otherwise correct yeah i you know i i, I always say that um listening is really important mm -hmm. and so i try to give everybody their chance to argue their position mm -hmm. and i stay you know i try to keep my mind empty of preconceived notions yeah. and let yeah. people argue but then ultimately there comes a time when a decision has to be made and once the decision has to be made, I tend to um, not look back and not tolerate 
people that aren't going the common direction. And I really do seek consensus. It, it, it bugs the heck out of me if I've got, you know, five people in a meeting and one person has a dissenting view because, you know, if you got smart people, if somebody doesn't agree, you should listen to them and make sure you understand their issue and give them a mm -hmm. chance to persuade others. And 99% of the time, everybody does come around to um, agreeing with each other. And um, yeah, it, you know, it's very rare for me to be in a meeting where we ultimately can't get everybody focused on one thing. And at Sierra, one of the things that uh, we did very well was each year we would have a strategy meeting and we'd say, what are we going to do this year? Mm -hmm. And when new ideas would come up during the year, I would say, hold it for the annual strategy meeting. And once we got on a path, we were good about sticking to that path and staying there for a year and avoiding distractions. So if a new machine or something would happen mid-year, I'd say, forget it. We're not going to do that. You know, bring it up at the uh, annual strategy meeting. So. And that's hard to do in these type of situations because uh, you want to be the first one to the table, especially someone like you reading the book. You're uh, you're innovative type of guy. You're a guy that wants to, to path find rather than, than follow a path uh, for the most part. Um, hard work. That was an underlying thing. Uh, you were a workaholic. Uh, is that okay to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's certainly still true. Okay. And that never ends. Uh, that's something that is innate or learned and it just doesn't go away. So hard work, innovation. How does the man who, where the buck stops, because that's where the buck is, uh, how does he allow the hard work, the innovation, it's all here, but yet be able to run such a business at such a grand scale and really allow everybody else to operate the ship, if you will? Well, I mean, first off, you got to have people you trust and um, and be quick to cycle them out if you don't trust them mm -hmm. or if they're not doing their jobs. But I, you know, I, I was good about um, being able to delegate mm -hmm. and, um, you know, give good people, give them their space to do their job, give them the um, metrics. You know, I, I used to say, you know, that which can't be measured can't be improved. So one of the first things we'd all talk about before deciding what we were going to do is how are we going to measure success? How are we going to know if uh, it worked or not? And so the divisional guys, you know, I, I, would, I would tell them how much money they got to spend and I would tell them what we expected for it and then measure them against that. But the techniques they used to get from here to there, I mean, I didn't really much care. It, um, you know, the goal was just to spend this much money and deliver that much revenue in this product category. So I didn't have to get too mired down in the products themselves. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I, mean, I hate to sound ivory towerish, but the answer yeah. is when you got a thousand people spread to um, 12 countries with, uh, you know, 60 or 70 products in development, you can't get too mired in any one product, whether you like want to or not. It seemed like you were always at the ground floor of something. Is that something that was okay. innate or is that something that uh, was just, you, you fell into hard work? I, you know, I do I hard work. Yeah. I, I, I work a lot. I don't know if I work hard. You know, if I wasn't doing something I didn't love, I probably wouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, you know, I guess it's kind of built in. You notice that uh, we're talking at uh, 8 AM my time and mm -hmm. I've already been at my computer for almost three hours and um you know i like mornings when it's quiet and i can get a lot of work done and through the day i sneak in work whenever roberta's not looking so mm -hmm. at this point in our lives she kind of hates my computer and thinks of it as the bad guy because i'm oh. always there at so, least she's not saying it's the bad girl because that's uh, a whole nother well, story she does, you know if you were to ask roberta she would say the computer is <laughs> the, uh, is my mistress and uh, the one I sneak away to when she's not looking. So, and um, that, well, let's see, what were we talking about? Now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, let me reset us because I, I, I have a question that you had mentioned earlier. You had, you had mentioned that you needed to know how you measured success. And that was something that you would always uh, hone yeah. in on. So your perspective, 
uh, from the, the top on the grand scheme of Sierra. We'll just call it Sierra. There's so many, there's so many names, yeah. but we'll call it, we'll call it Sierra. How did you measure success of Sierra? Um, you know, happy fans. I, I really was more, I ran Sierra like it was a big fan club. Mm-hmm. I knew that uh, we were a consumer products company and that we had to have happy customers. I mean, it's just part of, um, you know, when, when I picked the role models for the company, you know, obviously um, uh, Disney was one of the two companies I picked. Mm-hmm. And Disney at that time, I, I think it's less so today, but if you go back um, 30, 40 years to when I was doing Sierra, Disney was kind of magic for people. And, um, you know, parents, that's all they could think about with their kids was Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And, you know, Walt Disney had his own show on TV. And sure. I, you know, I was a uh, paper boy when I was growing up. And they were constantly running these contests because I was in L.A., where if you were the best sales guy, you got a free trip to Disneyland. And I don't know how many times I went to Disneyland, but it was just hundreds. And every time you walked through that gate, there was this magical feeling. And I wanted to somehow create a company that could inspire that kind of loyalty in customers. So really... You know, I, I measured our success in terms of um, how many products here we could sell people and whether or not, um, you know, they felt that kind of magical experience when they had opened a Sierra product. And so customer support, I mean, we loved customers to death. If they complained about anything, we refunded their product immediately. Yes. If uh, we screwed up, we had met our mistake and we moved forward. So, yeah, I, you know, I measured our success in, um, people's willingness to come back and try a new product from us. And that translated into profit. But profit, you know, if you, if you spend your time chasing profit, you're going to kind of lose because um, it's, it's a s- symptom. It's not the disease. I mean, the real, the real key thing is to excite people to buy your products. And that's why you know, I remember having all these debates with our um, sales VP because we had a separate sales from marketing and, uh, you know, they would say kind of like, what, what am I here for? Why, what, what, what's my job? And to the marketing guy, you know, his job, I thought, was to excite people about Sierra's products. Mm-hmm. And the sales guy was to not worry about that, just go out and try to figure out how to get the products on shelves. And so there was a pretty clear de- delineation. And one mm-hmm. was measured by um, how well a product that no one had ever heard of would immediately get bought off shelves, you know, what kind of advanced demand had we built for the product? And, um, well, uh, so to answer that question, uh, sorry. Next. Well, as an example, what was one of those, they came in, they pitched it to you and something that hasn't been done before. What was one of those that actually went off the shelves immediately that you were surprised? Well, well, keep it to the game, uh, the adventure game industry, if if you can. I know you've put out yeah. so many games. Well, I mean, there were products that had you you wouldn't have thought would sell well, like mm-hmm. Freddy Farkas, an adventure like that, or yeah. Orange Passage, where um, you know you had the Al Lowe name going for it, but Al was best known for Leisure Suit Larry. Yeah, he wasn't known for uh, Torrens Passage, kind of a kid's uh, product. Sure. But we built enough excitement that the product sold really well, and probably we could have done sequels to it. Similar with, um, I'm trying to think what other adventure games Al did, but uh, we built demand. Well, and even new series. I mean, Gabriel Knight, um, Laura Bow. Yeah. All yeah. of those sold well. I don't think we ever launched an adventure game series that didn't do well. And it and was you- because of the products that preceded it. People were excited to see a new series. And you had mentioned Sierra's a fan club. So if you, especially at that stage, at that timing, when you mentioned Torrance Passage, you mentioned uh, Lorboza, you know, right about when, I mean, things were really, really booming and things were making, uh, making headways, you know, adventure games were, it was the only games to really play at that time, you know. But um, if you marketed it right, we trusted you. Oh, yeah. you, were, you were Ken. 
you were Roberta, you were Al. Uh, these were these were people that we felt like. I don't want to say it's our it's our weird uncles or our friendly our friendly aunts and everything like that, but we wanted to support those who were supporting our lives, and so I yeah. guess I guess that's success, sure. as you mentioned. Well, it's weird that we're still perceived as uh, the adventure game company. When you ask mm-hmm. people what they think of CR four, it uh, and you know and and of the last game we shipped, kind of they're the last big one that. I'm associated with was probably Phantasmagoria. Mm-hmm. And that sold a million copies in a time when games weren't selling that many copies. Right. So I mean, it was a much smaller market in those days. And yet, um, you know, we broke through and we sold a ton of copies. And that that's held a test of time to the to this day. In fact, especially right now, there's uh there's a big kick to get these uh these spooky games out there right now. And uh Phantasmagoria is always on the top of everyone's everyone's lists. And so so now did you consider yourself um a game maker or a game developer? We were, I guess you'd say vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we built the games we sold. We were not a publisher. Mm -hmm. We, you know, and that was part of what went wrong when uh, we sold the company. Mm -hmm. Whereas I tried to protect our product. I wanted our product to feel like a CR product when it went out the door. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, you know, we were were kind of away from other companies. I really didn't want our people studying competitors' products. You know, I always kind of had this feeling that leaders lead and followers follow. And so I really wanted, um, I guess, to be insular or whatever. I wanted our people to kind of build their products, think of new ways to do new things and not worry about what the competition was doing. You know, part of what went wrong um, after the company was sold is I think they fell into that old trap of uh, marketers studying the bestseller charts, mm-hmm. figure out what people want by looking at the top of the bestseller chart and then launch a product to compete with it. And that's kind of a dumb way to go about it, or at least it wasn't my way. Um, I liked having all internal developers that were building product only for Sierra that uh, bought into our vision and uh, were using our tools so that all of our products kind of looked alike. And um, yeah, we're built with a similar philosophy. And, you know, and as far as leading, you know, it, um, I always thought of it as playing catch up. I had a pretty good idea in mind for where I thought the industry would evolve to. And so it was more a matter of looking at technology as it evolved and saying, okay, can we do this now? You know, when we were doing, you know, black and white mystery house, I knew someday you'd be able to do color. I knew someday you'd be able to do sound. I knew, um, you know, someday you'd be able to do animation. But, you know, the best you could pull off in 1980 was um you know black and white outlines and so i think it was you know that one kind of vision of what the world might look like in 2020 that allowed us in 1980 to feel like we were innovators whereas you know people might have thought that but from my perspective it was really just a matter of looking at the hardware figuring out what it would do uh comparing it to the ultimate vision of where i thought we were going and then playing catch up you know, our, our company name was CR Online because I thought someday all of these computers would be linked and people would be able to have group type experiences. And, um, but it was just a matter of waiting. And sometimes we were too far ahead. I mean, we were doing uh, online games two years before they invented the internet. And uh, that kind of killed it because, oh, man. yeah, it, we, we lost money on it. But it was that... Um, looking forward that we were always well or catch up as i would say foresight leaders lead as you as you say so you mentioned you left a lot of money on the table waiting for so you were there but you were waiting for technology to catch up to you yeah i mean we were constantly like that i mean it um even with our support of sound i we were selling sound cards, not because we wanted in that business, but because we knew that the games needed music. Mm-hmm. And it was, um, yeah, I, I, we, we knew where the- Audio labs. Like, uh, uh, 
I never knew what a sound card was until I picked up a a Sierra a Sierra game and right on it it said I think it was Audio Labs if I remember right my brain works right yeah no we were supporting AdLib and AdLib that's what doing all these weird things and and we you yeah. know we had to push them we mm -hmm. we knew that um, we either had to wait for the hardware to come to us but we could accelerate I mean, it was nice to be in that position I mean a lot of people that will read my book will say, well, this is all kind of worthless information because unless you're an industry leader, you can't play the game that way. And, um, but we had the luxury from the beginning of being an industry leader and being able to kind of define the business. And that, you know, and, and our customers sensed that. They could tell that if they were curious where the business was going, buy a Sierra product and take a look. Sure. And um, in our adventure games, Roberta's job, I, as crazy as it sounds, was to um, set the state of the art, and then we would build the technology to match that. And then the other adventure games would take what she built and leverage it. So each time a Roberta game came out, it was, um, I mean, it was important. She was a good game designer, but really the thing that uh, made the difference was that it, people kind of figured out that it was her games where we would uh, try to pioneer new technology and then the other adventure game series would leverage it so there you go um leaders lead going back going back to that and i appreciate you sharing that tidbit on on roberta i i hadn't put two and two together on that so uh noted now we'll call you a pathfinder okay did you ever have any competitive resentment towards uh, other companies who maybe crossed your path? You set the path, they crossed your path, and uh, so you left money on the table, and they were able to exploit what you had already done. Was that a competitive yeah, thing for you? Well, I mean, in a way, obviously, mm -hmm. with um, LucasArts, I mean, they... Mm -hmm. Basic. I wouldn't say they copied us. I mean, I, I mean they, they did the right thing. They recognized, um, they did cool things. They did new stuff people hadn't seen before. I remember seeing Loom. I remember seeing Broderbund with uh, Mist. Mm -hmm. And um, people were doing cool things out there. And it did spook me a little. And that, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't like seeing competitors end run us and do something good that uh, get to a cat and with you know and, and we kind of broke our own rule about following when we launched uh, lighthouse which um was inspired by i guess i would say by um this and sure. uh, that is just definitely not sierra style to see a hit out there and then try to chase it i mean that that's so weird for us but we did it but if you do it better that's something you know and i'm, I'm not going to uh to put any other games down or anything um a lighthouse in my opinion was better than than mist and so yep. that that's one thing so if you could do it better then like you can't reinvent the wheel and at that time you were creating the wheel there's always going to be someone someone who who follows as long as you continue building what you're doing and setting the standards that's where legends are made and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, you just have to be a heck of a lot better. I remember um, I was in um, I was in a uh, group called YPL with um, oh, what was his name? The guy that founded Intuit. Um, uh, you remember his name? I Crap. don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I don't remember it, but I remember him talking about his competitor. And we'll just call him that rich guy. Huh? We'll just yeah, call him that I, rich guy. <laughs> uh, I suspect he did well. Uh, Scott yeah. Cook, maybe? Yeah, I wish I could remember. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, he was talking about trying to launch um, Quicken as a competitor. Or, or, well, at the time, they had no competition. I mean, it was the first checkbook program. Mm -hmm. uh, this goes back 35 years or something into it. It's gone on to fame and fortune. But he... Um, yeah, he, he, he would hold up a picture of a pencil and say, this is my competitor. And to be better than a pencil, I mean, people already know how to use a pencil. But if I'm going to compete with a pencil, I got to not be 10% better, 20% better. I got to be like 500% better. I mean, because, you know, it's tough to bounce somebody out of the park. 
And you don't do it by being 10% better. And I think with Lighthouse, we were 10 or 20% better maybe, but, um, but we were never going to get the same fame and whatever that little piece of the action was because we didn't lead. So really the goal at Sierra was to find things where we could lead and then uh, feed off of those, not, um, not to do somebody else's product 10% better. It was like the whole, uh, you know, what do you call it, shooter category. You know, once somebody did Doom, then maybe Quake was 10% better and something else was, you know, Half-Life. But really a lot of the original um, credit for pioneering a new genre probably goes back to Doom. So, I don't know. Id. And uh, you had an opportunity there, did you not? Yeah, we should have bought those guys. I just um, didn't feel right in that I've always, I really thought of Sierra in a lot of ways as kind of a Disney-ish type product line. And I didn't like the idea of a game where you're running through a building with a gun shooting at people. I mean, that feels, um, I, I, you know, although ultimately I, I'd also say that, you know, I, 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 we want to build the product people want to buy, you know, it's sure. not up to me to tell them what their morality should be. Uh, we, you know, it's up to them to tell us what they want to play, but I, that was kind of in conflict with my personal beliefs, which is that I just really think if you take young kids and train them in how to use a gun that, you know, 99% will be fine, but there'll always be 1% that are a little, um, oh, I don't know, um, not completely healthy. And we'll sure. uh, take that experience and do bad things with it. And I really didn't want to be part of that. It felt to me like training kids to use guns is, although, you know, I played with soldiers when I was a kid. So I don't know. I was kind of all over the map on it. But it just didn't feel like a product that felt Sierra. And so I passed on it. I respect I that. Huh? I know. I know that you knew that that was the future. I know that you do that that was the future. And I respect the fact that you stayed true to your brand, um, whether it was the right business money decision business. or yeah. not. Yeah, it's not all about money, but mm -hmm. um, you know, and the overall brand too. I mean, it just didn't feel right for us. But sure. although you see that I, uh, I did get greedy later when I saw uh, Half-Life and uh, signed up the Valve guys. So, well, however, you had several several umbrella companies and you know that was valve you know you could kind of separate the two a little bit and half-life didn't have a mode called knee deep in the dead like like uh, doom did so a you know, little bit a little bit different well they uh, persuaded me that it was an adventure game and had a plot and that it was kind of uh, it was yeah so i don't one know one of the greatest I mean, ever one of the greatest funny, games funny ever. Sign, hindsight i guess uh, but we we did sign that product and we did quite well with it so. and i'm sure that helped when you inevitably uh got that check at, oh, yeah. the, at the end of the day um so you always seem to be on the ground level as i mentioned but you also seem to have the ability to exit uh when it's when it needed to be 1996 it seemed like at least the adventure side foresight so um are you a wizard ken am i a what are you a wizard ken a wizard <laughs> yeah i i i do think that um yeah i still think of roberta and i mm -hmm. like wizard and the princess or something that um it seems fitting that that was one of our more famous games because um we're, we're such different people. I mean, she's a princess in a lot of ways in terms of being creative and a designer. And I, um, yeah, it, it does feel kind of like that. So, and I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm not a wizard, but I am certainly a technical wizard, I guess you'd say, and that I do love computers. I do love programming and that, um, yeah, it, it's kind of a fitting, uh, fitting analogy for us. Yeah. Okay. So business in the front, party in the back we got all the business stuff out of the way so let, let's have a little fun all right sure. let, let's kind of let's kind of shake it up a little bit here i am going to put two minutes on the clock here and we're gonna have a little fun with some questions here okay and so quick answers first things that come to your head elaborate if you want so here we go three two one Ken, have you ever shaved your impressive mustache? And if so, did you lose your strength? 
Ah, uh, never <laughs> have. Always kind of thought about it. Roberta says I'd look 20 years younger if I did. So probably I should someday, maybe for an anniversary present or something. She hates my mustache. That, um, oh, and I probably, but nobody would recognize me anymore. You are known for that, uh, that mustache. We'll, we'll say that. This may be a hard one. First thing that comes to your head. Leisure Suit Larry. Which Hollywood actor would you cast to play Leisure Suit Larry in a movie? Oh, I don't know. Oh, they're uh, going to be so upset if they hear. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, uh, God, in the old days would have been, you know, Rick Moranis or somebody like that. Or Old days is when it was. So there I, you go. I, was, uh, I always, after Sierra, wanted to buy the rights to do an animated feature on Leisure Suit Larry and thought that an animated an hour and a half thing would be great. And Al could have written it. and. So I, I did make a couple of letters to try to buy the rights to it. I wanted to do, um, I thought it could be really funny. And, you know, I, I played the reason, well, I didn't play. I played the first two minutes of uh, the new Leisure Suit Larry and looked at the ads and it did look cute, but it seemed like they had gotten a little more sexist than Al wrote. Oh, yeah. And, um, that was never, you know, that was never the goal. And that always kind of bothered me. I thought there would be a way to do, you know, Al knew how to walk that line and keep it. Clear. Anyway, sorry, I didn't know. There, was, there was the dichotomy there. He was here and he was here, but he always stayed right on he one side of the one side of the level. And I thought the new one maybe crossed the line. And um, that's so something I want to touch there. bases with you in a little bit, because that is something very specific that I'd like to ask you. Okay. Uh, who would win in the fight? King Graham or Roger Wilco? Oh gosh, I it uh, obviously King Graham um, sold more copies, but um, Roger Wilco was far closer to my heart. I never played King's Quest, and I always loved the uh, humor in the Space Quest games. And you never um, played yes. King's Quest? Huh? No. no but, oh, <laughs> Roberta. Like a... She she hates that. That uh, I mean, I would try to play at it, but. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I loved the product and loved uh, how well it sold, it just wasn't my style. You know, it Black Cauldron, um, I don't know why. I just never, never resonated with me. Well, Roger Wilco would always fall ass backwards in the success, while King Graham, I'm pretty sure uh, at the end of King's Quest V, he was taking steroids. I mean, he had that arm. I mean, what is going on there? So we'll we'll give King Graham the advantage on that one in a fist fight, yeah. though. All right. Uh, one last one here. The famous uh, Sierra Hot Tub cover. Yeah. Um, insert question here. Now, I'm not even going to ask you a question. Just a wink, brother. Just a wink. Hey, thank you. <laughs> that was fun. I, 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 I'd go back and film that day over and over again for the rest of my life. Kind of fun stuff. Oh, yeah. And that might be something that we cover in a little bit here. All right. So we're going to have a little bit more, a little bit more fun. We're going to talk a, a, a little bit more adventure game stuff. And um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about boating uh, coming up. So uh, first things first, uh, I don't know if you know, but on the internet, uh, a reaction videos are, are huge. They're a huge thing, Ken. Don't know if you know that. So basically uh, people show a video or a picture and they get a reaction out of that photo. So in that vein, I am going to share my screen and I want to get your reaction to a couple of these photos, Ken. All right? Okay. Okay, here we go. Oh, so, oh hey, I, I don't, see, I don't know that I've seen this. This is kind of fun. Let's see, about the other side of the bar, hiding an inflatable. Oh. <laughs> I got to say, Ken. Wow. Um, uh, that's obviously me. It looks like yeah. you are looking at Larry more than you are looking at the this lovely lady to the right. Oh, I think that would be impossible. She would captivate <laughs> my attention. So. De definitely have the uh, the Ken Williams mustache here. Yeah, that does a while. And unfortunately, the uh, Ken Williams belly, which I'm not too happy with. But uh, Oh, boy. It is what it is. So, that's a cute picture. That was uh, one of the Al Lowe. Larry Games. All right, here I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. share share another one here for you here. Oh God. 
Uh, look at this. All right. And, and what's going on here? I, I think the artist. I look grumpy in that picture. I think I the artist put a whole there. lot of attention on, uh, on Roberta's lakes here, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, I, how could I not be happy sitting there having a drink? Got a, a hot babe beside me, and maybe maybe I thought Larry was trying to horn in on the action or something. I don't know. It, yeah, and once again, you are looking at uh, at Larry and instead Larry. Of, of looking at your lovely wife here, and that is Roberta. Uh, I'm, I I want to make sure you know that. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Uh, very very good. Let's just see Larry. Always some good. Dude, always Gabe. some good photos here. All right. Yeah, how come they changed Larry's look from game to game? I mean, it, that part of what you should do in a game is have a character sheet and have a distinctive look to them. But it seems like every game gets a shiny new leisure suit Larry. I mean, that was part of um, what I wanted to focus on at Sierra was to get the characters recognizable and be able to sell T-shirts and, you know, do the whole thing. But Larry changes his look every game. Dumb. No. And uh, still... At least he's wearing the same leisure suit, even to yeah, this day with the, the with the with the new ones. And he has had that um, he's had that that the balding on the back of his hair for yeah. twenty five years now. So let's share another screen here, Ken. And like me, he hasn't aged. But oh, oh, I I call your bluff. What do we got here? Hey, that's me. That is oh, that's God. definitely you. Um, why do they pick on me? That's, that's no, that is incredible, Ken. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Legendary. Um, when I was a little boy, I had no idea who Ken Williams was. Just, just so you know. Um, but I did happen to pick up on some patterns as I got a little bit older. <laughs> like, um, there was always a dude with the mustache. Later on, I I learned that that is founder of Sierra Online, Ken Williams. Another note is uh, I learned what a kumquat was. <laughs> on this scene so there's two educational games that i had played when i was a kid uh castle and the dr brain series and oh, yeah. leisure suit larry just for different educational reasons <laughs> i love dr brain i thought that was one of the best series we ever did uh, i really i really learned a lot from dr that, brain uh, yeah i can't i mean why didn't they stick with that i mean that that kind of uh, you know, I'm going to share. Foils. I mean, Foils was a good series. They let all this stuff die that was a wonderful series. But, oh, well. That's because we all have uh, ADD as we get older, and they needed everything to move. And I'm, I'm not sure. Crazy. One more picture here coming at oh, you, okay. Ken. Here we go. Oh, I love that picture. And Roberta looks great. And um, Who's this guy? Huh? You know what's uh, that picture? Um, the sad part. He, yeah, it doesn't come through in the picture, but he was uh, he was very gay, and uh -huh. uh, this was thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and it was a small country town, so he was a little more out of place than he even looks in the picture. Okay, um, really nice guy, and he was our waiter. And when I asked him to do this, he, he busted up. Well, and, uh, did you I pay the man the newspaper to find a photographer to take the picture? And um, and he thought it was funny, so and somehow I wound up with all the uh, slides that were the outtakes from the shooting, and I started oh. to run more pictures. But then I didn't want to go find model releases or anything for um, right. Diane and Susan, the other two girls in the hot tub. And plus, um, I don't think we were very official in those days. I don't know we ever had any kind of agreement with the photographer. And I uh, see or with Rick. So. Um, <laughs> Well, who knows? But anyway, that's well. If that's funny. the case, we better stop sharing the screen. Like <laughs> by internet standards, that's not a particularly racy picture. But um, uh, today, today, it, not it not so a, much. It was, it was fun picture. So, who were the other two in there? Uh, you mentioned oh, their names. Oh, let's huh? see. Bob Davis, who wrote uh, the games for us, um, mm -hmm. Ulysses and the Golden Fleece. Um, okay. And it was his wife. Okay. And. Um, and I'm trying to remember. I think he's the one who, in Hackers, went on to have drug problems and mm. uh, struggled. But I got an email from him recently, well, maybe two years ago, saying he had kind of cleaned up his act and gone on and uh, is doing well. 
And the other one, uh, Diane was, um, I think married to uh, one of our production managers and, um, real nice lady. And I think she's still in Oakhurst, but I'm not sure. So. Legendary Sierra lore right there. Um, I was putting some slides together last night and my wife comes in. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> take it easy. Like, uh, this is, this is for uh, a, a wonderful gentleman that I'm talking to on, on <laughs> tomorrow night. It's nothing like that. So, Very oh famous. boy. Yes. Yes. So, okay. Let's talk some adventure games here. We're gonna we're gonna calm down a little bit. Break time's over. Let's let's tuck our shirts back in. Let's get moderately <laughs> moderately yeah, more serious here. Yeah. So. Like Steuben or whatever his name is. Well, Ken, what was your biggest earner? Which game was was my biggest what earner? Let, let's talk adventure oh, games specifically. You know, um, of adventure games, well, obviously mm -hmm. Phantasmagoria. Mm -hmm. uh, although it cost a lot to produce, I think that was most of our games. Um, ranging from Mystery House that cost zero mm -hmm. to um, Phantasmagoria that cost about six million. But most, I would say, were kind of in the 700,000 to about a million and a half, okay. which is uh, nothing compared to modern budgets. You know, um, I remember at the time uh, thinking we were overspending on these games, that it was really expensive. But I think today, you know, for somebody to spend 20 to 100 million on a game is fairly common. So. Uh, but not for an adventure game. Huh? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I wonder what they spent on um, a company called Odd Fellows did some King's Quest games. And I don't know how big the teams were or what they spent. I mean, the result looks really nice. So, but. Uh, I don't know. And they had some big, uh, some big Hollywood voice actors, Christopher Lloyd uh, in there. And yeah. So that I'm sure that wasn't cheap i know grim it? fandango the rumor was it cost three million dollars to make uh grim fandango and um i don't Anything think they made, well? didn't sell all that well at, at, at the no. beginning for such a for such a uh a historic uh looking back as such a historic game interesting well, you know, in terms of profitability for a game i mean it was always king's quest because it sure. sold darn many copies um Although Leisure Suit Larry was right up there with it and Space Quest, um, actually all of them. Yeah, when I think about it, the only series that didn't really do well would be the first of, well, like a Gold Rush, something like that. I mean, it did well, but not a big mega hit. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think what other adventure games, you know, the Gabriel Knight series did well. Uh, Conquest of Camelot, um, Christy Marks, I think she did two games in that series. It was Robin the one Hood? Called Conquest, uh, of mm -hmm. Conquest of the Longbow. Conquest of the Longbow. And then her hu husband or significant other, Peter Ledger, I think he died. And that kind of um, put her in a funk. And that was kind of the end of the series. Gotcha. That's how I remember. And then I think she went on to do books or something. But that, that was disappointing because her games were great. Yeah, really. Yes. We didn't uh, launch any uh, turkeys in the adventure game category. Everything did really well and met expectations. Two, two. Yeah, that's what you want to say at the end of the day. In retrospect, um, we did well. And not yeah. everybody could say that in business. Yeah, I mean, there's places I was disappointed in that um, we, Phantasmagoria 2, um, Laura and I did a great job, but it was too different from Laura from Phantasmagoria 1 and didn't, um, didn't feel like a sequel. And it was rushed. We got it out too close to when Phantasmagoria shipped and it kind of killed Phantas. Uh, so there were some mistakes along the way. Diminished but, returns in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. But overall, I mean, I can't think of, you know, mixed up Mother Goose. I mean, even that, an adventure game for kids. And that was a big hit for us. We made a lot of money on that one. So they all there work. you go. So I'm going to throw a couple, uh, I don't want to say rapid fire, but we'll got some quick hitter questions here. Um, okay. Which game, and it could be anything, made you wish that you had a mulligan on it? Oh, I mean, well, I mean, lots of them. It, First thing uh, that comes to your mind. Post, I talk about that in the book. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any others that um, 
in general, everything went pretty well. There were a few dynamics, uh, even adventure games where, you know, Willie Beamish never really kind of caught on. That was, uh, that was my childhood. And, you know, Jeff Tennell, who worked at Dynamics, was an incredibly brilliant guy and did some of our best products ever with Incredible Machine. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, there was another series that was done at Dynamics. Yeah, they wanted into the adventure game business. And Willie actually did better than another one they did that was kind of a serious one that I forget what was. Was it EcoQuest? Huh? Was it EcoQuest? Oh, it was a serious, uh, like a detective type game. Mm-hmm. Hmm, I'd have to look back. I think there were three or four series they did, and they did Rama with, yeah. uh, with Arthur C. Clarke. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of went nowhere. So there were some adventure games that failed. And, uh, it was sad because they were, um, the Dynamics guys are brilliant. I mean, it was really unusual for them to do something that didn't catch on big. But um, but they kind of, um, you know, they kind of bonked. Well, Willie, I guess, did okay. But the other ones, Rama and something else didn't do well at all. So, yeah, so we make mistakes. So you put out something like 100 adventure games. I'm sure you hard. You didn't play all of them, certainly. Uh, what was your favorite? Oh, it would be Leisure Suit Larry or Space mm-hmm. Quest, you know. And, 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 and I always was kind of sad because I didn't get to play the games like other people did because mm-hmm. I would see them pre-production and I would be so eager to play them that I'd start playing them when they would crash every few minutes. And uh, I didn't get to experience them ever as a regular person. So I wish I could go back in time and wait until the game was done and then get to play it like a regular person. But I didn't. I'd see them, you know, three rooms here and three rooms there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I liked that they made me laugh. Yeah, you know, I was so serious. I was working so hard. that something that was just kind of an escape that I could just go laugh for a few minutes. So it wasn't even so much that I liked them better than the other series. It was just that they were easier to hit, laugh, and get out. and move. You back didn't to have to be life. you. You didn't uh, have to I be have you to for a couple minutes. minutes. Yeah, it was true. Inside the company, I was always um, super serious, and I would try to set an example in some ways by not um, ever engaging in idle chit chat with anybody. You know, it always kind of, if there was a way to finish a meeting at 13 minutes instead of 14, that was my focus. And uh, I would agonize for 10 minutes how to trim two minutes off a meeting. So, oh, man. Now uh, I'm nervous because this is this is a long interview, and I apologize in advance. Oh, no. this is, now, now I'm laid back. Now I'm a, I'm a different kid. So no worries. But, All right. So let's not have any worries here. Let's talk about which developer was the loudest in the room. Oh, um, you know, I had such good people. You know, Jeff Stevenson, who was the father of our uh, AGI and SCI. I mean, he was great. He was highly opinionated, and he would uh, stand up to me and argue with me. And even um, AGI, the programming language that we used, uh, Jeff talked me out of and into doing something object-oriented, kind of completely different kind of language. And to tear down you know, something that had been so successful for us and start fresh wouldn't have happened without uh, Jeff's uh, and my respect for him. And uh, so that was, that was cool. All of our developers, though, were, you know, uh, Damon Sly, I mean, the guy who wrote Red Baron and Aces, and these guys just to be in the same room with was so cool for me. And I was so jealous of them because all I wanted to do was write code, and I was stuck being this uh, corporate jerk who would um, oh, man. You know, have, to, have to worry about budgets and all kinds of crap I really didn't want to do. I, you know, more than anything in life, I wanted to work for me. And uh, not be this kind of corporate jerk and uh, just sit and write code all day, but couldn't do it. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's hard to differentiate between the artist and and the art. You know, if you actually want to run a business, uh, you got to drop something. And so kudos to you. And we appreciate that as fans. Um, so which dev was the most obsessive in building his art? Which, which, who was the, which, what? which developer was the most obsessive in, in building his art? He's going to slam the table oh, for what he wants. You know, probably if you go back to the very beginning, I mean, people like um, John Harris, who built Frogger, 
I mean, he was in love with the um, uh, Amiga and wanted to prove to the world that it was this incredible machine. And all he could think about was um, showing why it was so much better than an Apple II or a Com64. And uh, yeah, so I remember him convincing me that we should be on the machine and how proud he was of uh, the product that came out. So, but I had a lot of developers like that who were um, in love with uh, their work. So it happened a lot. As you should be. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned kind of wanting to keep it in the family earlier. Uh, okay. So we're going to call them rock star developers. Um, was there ever any rock star developers outside of Sierra that dropped you as resume? Um, yeah. Known, I mean, known developers, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, Sid Meier, um, I certainly respected his works. Mm -hmm. Um, the guys at Infocom, you know, I love their adventure games. I mean, they were incredible. And we were saved, I think, by the fact that they didn't go into graphic adventures. If they had, they'd have probably really uh, uh, messed us up because I don't think I had anybody that could have um, uh, competed with their parsing and stuff. Well, they, we'd have done what we had to do to stay in, but had they not um, fizzled uh, by departing into business software, they'd have probably messed us up. So, well, and the guys at LucasArts, um, I forget who wrote Loom and Monkey Island, but, um, you know, uh, they, Ron, they Ron Gilbert. Oh, Ron Gilbert, yeah. Um, certainly scared us. Um, no, it was an industry full of really good developers. And, you know, I miss those days. I mean, because we all knew each other and we'd party together and, we didn't really consider it competition because the industry was young and it was growing faster than any of us could have kept up with. And it was, um, yeah, it was just this cool experience. Like we were all kind of creating this new world together. It was so, a land rush, I guess you could say. So, um, uh Okay, you, we mentioned Ron Gilbert. You say that you wanted to keep it all in the family. You didn't want outside. But say Ron Gilbert says, Ken, I'm leaving Lucas. Here's my resume. Come on, you're going to tell me that you're not going to hire Ron Gilbert? Well, I would, well, would I have? I mean, it's a good question. I don't know. I probably would have. But in general, I didn't like to hire anybody from a competitor and sure. wouldn't do it in the early days because I just didn't really want, it was almost like a cancer. If you hire somebody from another company, their culture is going to creep into your company. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really want somebody running around saying, here's how we did it at LucasArts or here's how we did it at Broderbun. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I don't know. I, you know. And also I matured over the years. I was less sensitive on that subject toward the end than I was at the beginning especially when we were in Oakhurst and in those days when the industry was first going is when I was firmest on that. Wanted nobody anywhere near the company that had ever worked for a competitor. So, so in those times, was there any big, big name developer that you had to say, uh, no, I'm sorry. And if so, what was their reaction? I don't remember anybody like that. That um, I guess Sid Meier had called me and said, "Can I work for you?" Obviously, I'd have done it. Uh, Ron mm -hmm. Gilbert, sure. Any of the guys from um, Infocom, I forget uh, sure. their names. Crap, uh, who did like Zork and those things? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they were great games, and um, I, it's been forty years, uh, thirty years, so. I was I, hoping to get I was hoping to get a juicy tidbit there, but uh, it looks like it didn't. No, it, it, it didn't it's happen. So long, and it sure. didn't, and plus, I was never, I was never really a gamer. I mean, I didn't play yeah. these things. I could spot a product, and it, and it was probably good because I, you know, I tried to get, I tried to pretend to be a customer playing the games. Although there were some categories we were in where I clearly wasn't. You know, I could never relate to our NASCAR products, but they sold like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could sense the quality. You could look at it and you could tell that uh, these guys were passionate. Uh, uh, you know, one of our biggest ever products, a goofy product named uh, uh, Trophy Bass. You know, I thought, mm -hmm. who in the heck would ever want to fish on a computer? But Pinball. we sold the heck out of that thing. Huh? Pinball. Our, 
Pinball. Well, you know, I loved pinball. I loved sure. our pinball product. It, uh, it was a good time waster. Yeah. And I spent most of my life on airplanes. And it was nice because you could pull it out and you could sit and play pinball and then the flight was over. So, yeah. But Cap in capitalizing on a need, yeah. you know, huh? you capitalizing on a need and something you wouldn't think at first. OK, well, I'm going to play pinball. I'm going to play fishing on a on a computer. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Hey, right. people, I, you know, it, it was funny in that I, we really were bottom up. People would pitch me on an idea. And I always use the term, I would look at their eyes to see if they lit up. You know, I was looking for people who were excited and just couldn't believe that I didn't understand there was a market for the thing. You know, you, you go to somebody like Christy Marks, and um, I remember at the time, she, she used to go to these various festivals and dress up like she was medieval. And I, she lived for that. And Peter, I mean, he buffed himself out and would carry around a sword. And, you know, you could tell that, uh, I mean, I would never go to one of those festivals and dress up like an elf or something. But um, at least not I twice. Huh? At least not twice. No, I uh, <laughs> never me. Um, Ken and tights, not happening. Uh, but, Ken and tights. Oh, boy. No. It, uh, All right. I, yeah, I'm sorry, right. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No. I'm, I'm trying to get you rolling here because uh, you've you've been so kind to give us so much time. And and there's a couple of things I do really want to focus on. But one quick thing, you said you used to party together with uh, with a lot of these developers. What constitutes a good party with uh, Ken Williams? Oh, um, well, these days it's probably um, a glass of wine and in bed by 8 o'clock. But uh, – that was different in those days. Um, you know, at, at our house that uh, was in Oakhurst was huge. I don't know how huge, probably eight or 9,000 square feet. and had probably a 2,000 square foot game room lined with uh, uh, video game machines. I remember we had Crazy Climber and what else do we have? I don't know, a bunch of, a bunch of video game machines. And we had a bar and we had a dance floor and we used to hire local bands and invite over people and have a real live, um, just fun party where people would dance and have good time and uh, kind of get drunk and mm -hmm. go home at the end of the evening feeling pretty good. And th th I mean, that, that was good times, but yeah, we, ha we had one party when we uh, opened that house where we kind of invited a few people and wound up with over 800 people coming to the party that day. And but it was uh, it was a big house on a big piece of land. We had like five acres right on a river, and uh, that was pretty cool. And and everybody from the industry was there. But that was yeah, it was forty years ago. I was a lot younger and a lot more fun loving. And uh, yeah, different world. I can't even envision that today. We had a racquetball court in the home, and so there was uh, we we played something called volleyball. We had a uh, net across the center of the uh, racquetball court. And once a week, everybody had come over and we'd play volleyball. And, um, and then I played a lot of racquetball with people. And we had an Apple logo on the floor because I was kind of Apple-centric in those days. And, um, yeah, that, 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 was, uh, that was a different era, I guess I'll say. It's always good to look back and say, I did that. Yeah. And uh, and it sounds like you're you're glowing a little bit while 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 speaking of that. And I appreciate it. All Thanks. right. So 1996, you sold the company. Um, nice little check. We'll we'll say there. Um, did you we already covered the fact that you uh, you're a wizard <laughs> and you have foresight. Did you see the adventure game uh, industry? Well, let's talk adventure game industry specifically. Um, dying at that point well i can't say because i don't know what people have done since but in the few times i've taken a look at modern adventure games mm -hmm. i've been disappointed because it doesn't seem like they've really changed that much from when we were there and i think about you know if i could go back in time and if sierra had been around we would have tried to dramatically change the state of the art with each new release and probably would have kind of started with Phantasmagoria. And if you look at, you know, the big Roberta games, uh, there was something radically new in each of them. 
and how it's been that 25 years went by and games now look roughly the same, better animation. I mean, way better animation, way better user interface experience, way better looking graphics. But I always argued that, um, yeah, you know, graphics were just kind of like the paint job you put on the car. I mean, ultimately, you know, there's got to be something that really motivates people and is different. I don't, I don't, I wish we had stayed in. I mean, the characters, it would have been a different world. I can't say what it would have been, but I know that if, you know, if Sierra had been around and you'd looked at our games 25 years later and it looked the same, or it looked like the same with a better paint job, I would be really horrified. I mean, that would not be Sierra's way of doing business. The old analogy, how you could polish a turd. You have to have some substance, you know, and, um, but I will say nowadays, um, the industry is designed to work. You could be a one man team. Uh, you have, you have Kickstarter, you have all these different, uh, ways. Again, you've got things like AGI, which you created, you know, which anybody, you know, um, uh, we have good friends, uh, who have made uh have made their own companies um doing that you and i both do and so and they they put out good games now speaking of one man team you're not a you're not a guy that likes to sit down ken are we going to see a video game coming from you anytime soon uh yes and no i am um, you know just in the last week i started playing with uh I, you can't look market competitive without some game engine and obviously sci was 25 years ago i started playing with one called unity mm -hmm. and um actually written some code and went through the tutorials and built kind of a little um um angry birds type game and um and i also did some experience i mean this is one week but yeah. so i've just been trying to spin up to speed on that development environment and it's just shocking how good it is and how easy it is to build things. And so um, Roberta is going crazy because she, um, you know, like I said, she really kind of hates my computer and thinks I should be out jogging and, um, you know, playing tennis or whatever. Boating. And, uh, you know, deep down, she wishes she had married a jock, not a computer, uh, computer guy. And, uh, but I is what I is. And, um, yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, assuming that I can hide enough from her, then I will uh, <laughs> do something. Yeah, I've got an idea in mind for what I'm starting on, but just like my book, you know, I started here and I wound up way over there and it's almost unrecognizable. But I know what I'm doing currently. I, um, my, my current vision is to try to do something to teach programming to kids, you know, more like it was done in the Dr. Brain series or something where it's a fun, entertaining game, but also educational. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to build an adventure game where um, where uh, you've got like a robot with you that has to be programmed to help you solve puzzles. Plus, then you can send the robot off in other directions if you can write enough code that he can uh, move around and try to solve things. But we'll see if that idea hangs in there. Um, I like the idea of kids at a young age learning to program, just like mm -hmm. you know, if you go back 40 years, I mean, kids at a young age needed to type to function in the world. Now, I think really when you start thinking 30 years from now, if kids aren't learning to program now, I'm not sure. Um, well, or maybe they just learn, but it just seems fun. Plus, as a one guy, I know yeah. I can't go out there and compete with big dollar games. You know, whereas in a specific educational niche, maybe I could do something that would uh, both be helpful for people and fun for me. I just want an excuse to code. Well, yeah. it's nice for kids to be able to uh, to to learn something. And you know, nowadays you don't have to know Visual C plus plus. You know, and so it seems it seems like a, a a nice little way that you're going there. I like where you're at. Throwing stuff against the wall. Hopefully, can something will stick. And like you said, gives you the excuse to code. However, you're Ken Williams. You have a name here. Does that make yeah. you nervous? Does does that do you have to live yeah, up to well, your own name? Big expectations. That, um, yeah, that's a problem. Well, that's another reason. I, you know, I, I would, if I were, if we were willing to sit still, I would, you know, call Activision or somebody and say, you know, give me millions of dollars, let me hire a team and let me build a game. 
but um, we're not willing to sit still. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. at this point in our lives, anything I do, I have to be able to do from wherever I'm at, which is um, everywhere. So, um, and, and plus, you know, I like kind of working when I'm in the mood and being lazy when I'm in the mood. We are indeed retired. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, it, 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 us, yeah, no way did I want to go out. I, I have seen people, um, you know, like with some of these Kickstarter projects, where when they're working understaffed and under budgeted, um, and try to produce a game, it looks so bad compared to today's games that it kind of destroys their reputation. And I think by doing a adventure game focused on a fairly narrow slice and with the emphasis on being a tutorial rather than being an adventure game, I can try to experiment with some ideas I, I've had for how to evolve adventure games and adventure game interfaces without, um, um, yeah, without humiliating myself when people realize it's a small one-man project. And Ken, that's a niche. That, that's, that's a path again. And so a niche that is not uh, being exploited. And so now you mentioned you're retired. Let, let's, let's get this other yeah. stuff out of the way. That's a good, that's a good little transition point. Um, I mentioned that, that you've ever since you retired, you still have been in, uh, in the industry, I guess you will. You've created website builders, which has been uh, uh, successful. Um, you, you've done quite a bit of other things. You've written books, you're sailing. And you, your books, they're well received on sale. Uh, break down your passion here, my friend. Um, yeah, you mean like after Sierra? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Your 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 books. Uh, you 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 say you're well, the, not standing the, the still. The current book is selling insanely well. In fact, um, probably too well. I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, it was funny in that I said that. Um, if people wanted autographs to email me a picture of them in their book, and I got an insane number of requests that, um, well, I don't know what is it, it's over 250 or something so far. And, um, and I shut down a month ago. I said, okay, no more of that. That was a mistake. So, um, but the book is sold insanely well. And um, that's do you, cool. Do you have a number? Ken, do, uh, what, do you mind? Well, it's sharing? about 2,500 copies in the first three weeks, which for a uh, self published book, a print on demand with zero um, marketing, other than doing these kinds of interviews. And I'm going to stop doing these because um, I don't know, I don't want to oversaturate and sure. you know, people get tired of you too. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you're, you're either the last or next to the last. Okay. Um, at which point the book will either sink or swim on its own. And already it's exceeded expectations. So I don't know. Yeah, I wrote some boating books, which are also af after Sierra, um, we kind of hit our second 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. And what's weird is, you know, when people come up and they recognize my mustache and they recognize Roberta and they say, are you Ken Williams? And we always have to kind of answer and say, yeah, how do you know us? <laughs> and especially if we're around a marina, we're kind of famous for boating because we um, we did kind of a, um, well, because we crossed the Bering Sea and we crossed the Atlantic at a time when people weren't doing that in private boats. And you chronicle it. Mm -hmm. uh, and chronicled yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was blogging um, from the middle of the Atlantic. What is that? Uh, it's sad to think now, uh, 16 years ago when uh, communications weren't such that most people knew how to be blogging from a boat in the middle of the Atlantic. So, um, yeah, so we, we kind of went on to success doing that. And I wrote a bunch of boat books. And um, it, yeah, I don't want to bore anybody with it. But, uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, if I, if I had been a boater before I became Sierra, Sierra would have been a much bigger company. Because there was a lot that I learned in order to run a boat that would have helped me at Sierra. You know, the level of uh, planning and detail and organization and self-sufficiency. I mean, that was mm -hmm. the big thing. In order to run a boat, I suddenly had to be an electrician. I had to understand hydraulic systems, air conditioning systems. I mean, the amount of uh, reading I had to do to run a boat exceeded everything I had to do to be a software engineer. I mean, I, you know, suddenly I'm taking courses in diesel uh, engine repair and... 
uh, fuel systems and, and you have to do all that because if you're in the middle of the Atlantic and the engine blows, if you can't fix it, you're going to have to learn to swim. And that's no fun. So Any scares? Huh? Yeah, Any, yeah. It, it, well, you know, what's funny is I'm, um, I panic. I panic. I, I do have a bad habit of panicking. And there were times, um, you know, especially narrow passages with high currents where uh, I'll turn to Roberta and say, you got to drive now. I can't do this. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's she's got nerves of steel. She is a pretty incredible person. So, so would you say that you would be or would not be able to be a a, a pirate then? Because you gotta you gotta traverse I, those narrow those narrow spots back in the day. Oh no, I would say take all the treasure. Leave me alone. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I you know I'm I'm not uh, I, I'm not that brave. I you know I I don't even love riding on airplanes. I'm kind of. I'm kind of a sea level guy. There's no, uh, yeah, no surprise that I became a boater instead of an airplane captain. So. And and you mentioned you truly are 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 famous for for your boating books and for your your blog. And I assume that's something that that you're going to do until you can't. Correct. Yep. Yeah. We. Um, yeah, we love our boat, and I have many friends. Well, in fact, a lot of boaters are old because it's a expensive hobby mm-hmm. that uh, you really can't do until you're retired. I mean, there's no way, especially the kind of boating we do where you're crossing oceans. You know, there's um, very few people that do it, and they're all kind of older, which is kind of depressing. I don't like to be old, um, but you can't really afford to buy a boat and retire and go crossing oceans when you're still trying to earn a living and, you know, send your kids to school. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, no, I would expect that we probably got, you know, 10 to 20 years more of um, doing adventures. And I'm hoping that our biggest adventures are still ahead of us. So, so. Say, say hello, everybody. Yeah, this is Tundra. Tundra. Well, she hears that uh, mommy is up and wants to go out and say hi. No, we'll go ahead and clean. Yeah. We'll go ahead and finish this up then, because yeah. I have taken enough of your time. I put a sign on the door so that uh, said that we were doing this, so Roberta wouldn't come running in in her underwear or something. But uh, <laughs> good to hear. Good to hear. Although that might get a few uh, a few clicks. I know. It, like it be better. So. Well, Ken, I am so grateful to have you uh, on today. You're truly a, a, an industry titan. And we at AventureGamers.com, we at Weird Gaming Adventure, we truly wish you success, continued success on your book. We wish you continued happiness, sailing. You and Roberta were married at 19 years old. 18. Had a, it was 18 by four days. And 18, we'd essentially lived together in the year before that. So huge business, a true, uh, you founded, you were in a billion dollar industry and you happened to stay together throughout all of this. Continued success. We are so grateful to have you, Ken. Is there anything that you want to say on your way out? Tell us no, where you no. could find, where we could find your books. Oh, that's true. I should say that. It's mm-hmm. kensbook.com. Mm-hmm. And uh and Roberta's working on a book. And to no surprise, her site is Roberta'sbook.com. Okay. And um yeah, and I, I hope people like my book. And uh that's about it. So and I do, I could say unequivocally that that if you are interested in what the goings on in Sierra, if you have any business uh, interests, and if you just want to support can if you want to support roberta go buy the book i am joshua with weird gaming adventure for adventuregamers.com for ken williams we are so grateful to have everybody and we will see you in the next video